right, all right. Welcome back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Sunday Wire. I'm your host, Patrick Henningsen. We're streaming out live on the Alternate Current Radio Network and also at 21stCenturyWire.com. This is a live broadcast. If you're just tuning in midstream, you know that you can always listen to this show in the recording or podcasting format after the program. Uh, it will be syndicated later, a few hours after, uh, at Spreaker at 21stCenturyWire.com, and then later in the evening, early in the morning on iTunes iHeartRadio, Spotify, uh, and some of these other platforms. Most podcasting platforms will be syndicated on on all the major platforms uh, by usually by early uh, U.S. time, Monday morning. So uh, you can look at it there if you miss any of the live broadcasts. Now, our next guest is uh, piping in live from South Africa, and his name is Nick Hudson. He is uh, the founder of Panda, Pandemic Data and Analytics, uh, among other things. Uh, we'll talk about his uh, his background as well. And he's joining us on the live link right now. Hello, Nick. Hello, Patrick, and hello to your listeners. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Nick. Uh, luckily, we're sort of in the same uh, time zone ish <laughs> compared yeah, to thank talking. goodness I've done some I've done some pretty awkward starts during the last couple of years. <laughs> I'll bet you have. I'll bet you have. So you know it's a big challenge, especially with our our colleagues in Australia and uh, on the west coast of the u s. So luckily we're we're sort of in the same frame there. But now, uh, I, I really was uh, looking forward to getting you on the show, Nick, to talk about a number of things. and you know, really just to talk about this experience that we've all gone through over the last two years and where it's where it's heading. And um, you've looked really closely at so many different aspects of this crisis. We're talking about the global pandemic. And but bef- before we get into that, I, I want you to uh, just share with our listeners two things. One is how, how you how did you get into this this situation where you start an organization and this is quite an influential organization in terms of presenting data and also helping to sort of repackage or, or m- make more real the narratives that that are deceiving people coming from governments and uh, from the mainstream media. Panda has done a great job on all these fronts. But so and tell us how Panda got started, how, how you got into this. Yeah, well, it's, it started very informally. Um, I, as I was preparing for an investor conference, I'm a, a, I manage a private equity fund. Um, it was February last year, and there was this bug on the horizon, literally and figuratively. And um, I started talking to people just to make sure that I'd thought through it all and what this might mean. And as I looked at things with... A, 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 an interesting group, immunologist, a lawyer, an economist, and another actuary, um, which is, which is by the way, my qualification. I've never worked as an actuary for a day in my life, but uh, that was where I sort of started my studies. Um, we all began to agree that uh, there was a massive gap between the, the media narrative and the reality. We were trying we, as, as we could to get hold of real data and the real facts. And they were completely at odds with this emergent narrative about an airborne Ebola sort of thing. And we became even more concerned when lockdowns started rolling out. We were very worried that um, developing countries might be so foolish as to imitate um, the, the kind of lockdowns that were being rolled out everywhere else. We thought that would be a huge mistake because we don't have the social security and welfare network safety nets that, um, you know, developed countries have. Um, You you shut people out of their work and it's pretty much chaos and destitution from day one. And sure enough, uh, our government in lockstep with every other one in the world tore up its existing guidelines and went headlong down the crazy road of lockdown and uh, with, I might add, a great deal of popular support Um, because by then that media narrative had spread everywhere through social media, conventional legacy media, and um, lockdown was popular, was received very well. Of course, it was going to be for three weeks to flatten the curve. Of course, it wasn't. And we just sat down and, and decided, you know, we needed to do something. 
And we thought that it was particularly challenging because we were operating within a very narrow Overton window. Um, and so we decided to take on the question of whether anybody had put together any kind of cost benefit analysis. And we wrote a paper called Quantifying the Years of Life Lost to Lockdown and uh, stuck our hands in our pockets and put that out into the media. At that stage, media wasn't quite as censored and um, unisonic as it is now. And we managed to get it into some of the mainstream papers and it created quite a stir. In fact, uh, a, a very big stir. And we carried on using our networks to gain access to some of the um, political and public health uh, bodies. We got quite far. We got invited into the South African Coronavirus Modeling Consortium's meeting where we delivered comments about the extent to which their models were overblown. It was very much the same story as Neil Ferguson and Imperial College or IHME, you know, Bill Gates' story. And um, those comments were received and faithfully reported in the mainstream media. And then a couple of days later, of course, the model came out and it was even worse. Um, and so through all of this, we had people putting their heads up and saying, well, uh, you know, I, I share your sentiments, you know, and they kind of joined this fledgling organization um, and it just grew and grew. And then by October, we came to the conclusion that nothing that was happening in South Africa was happening as a result of our government's decisions, that they were all pursuing these various restrictions and policies and mandates under the air cover of the World Health Organization, and in particular, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and their various proxies. It had also become clear that the latter organization had profoundly captured every single public health institution and academic medical department in the country. And so we we said, okay, what are we going to do? And that was that began our internationalization about October 2020. And now Panda has several hundred members, scientists from all disciplines and other people who help with the logistics and the graphics and the production and so on. Um, and we've published hundreds of articles and they've been on hundreds of radio, TV, webinar, podcasts, so on, you know, it's quite, it's become quite a substantial organization and quite a handful to, to manage. Um, but that's the story in a nutshell. And I, I think it's interesting, you, you've got a, a background in, in finance, but also as an actuary. And so, you know, in terms of risk management, you're talking about a cost benefit analysis. I mean, some of us, that's immediately what was going through our heads when they started talking about shutting down whole sections of the economy, shutting borders down. And you could just start doing the calculations in your head of what the what the knock on effects, what the ramifications and the compounding problems that could result from that and, and that it would eventually result in massive borrowing by governments in order to pay people not to work or in order to pay businesses to, to shut their doors or to pay for all this PPE uh, uh, that's required for for this uh, to protect them against the pandemic. So, you know, where's the money going to come from? What's the result of, of, of basically inflating uh, and devaluing the currency? Uh, these are all practical questions that some people would be concerned with, but there's you said how they were popular, lockdowns were popular. I think that's a pretty accurate statement across the board. Generally, they were. But what does that say? This is a maybe a rhetorical question, but what does that say about the, the a lot of societies, a lot of countries around the world where they, 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 they will sort of defer to the state? They'll defer to authority or the, the chief scientific advisor. To, be, to pretty much run the economy to, and effectively run, make political decisions running the country um, without, without having any proportionality uh, or considering the proportionality of, of these heavy duty policies. Um, whereas, you know, that you probably were thinking that straight away and, and a lot of people like yourself were, that's the first thing that came to your head is this doesn't, it's not going to add up it's, and it might not end well. But uh, your, your thoughts on, on that side of things? 
Well, it, it's true what you say that, you know, the, there was a, a deferral to authority all around the world. But I think that took place um, in in the wake of fear and the fear arose from the most intense propaganda campaign that the world has ever seen. Um, that is for me an important part of the equation and it was actually the visibility of that narrative, the media narrative and the extent to which it departed from the facts that um, s struck an enormous amount of anxiety into me. I was, I, I, I usually sleep pretty well and for a, for a good few weeks I was battling to sleep. And uh, until a friend of mine said, listen, um, the reason you can't sleep at the moment is because knowing what you know and doing nothing is not, you know, they're not compatible for you. And that was kind of when we, we swung into, well, at least when I got my, my boxing gloves out and started fighting this story. And I haven't stopped since. But um, it was really that um, deliberate projection of fear that was so obvious and I think that enabled the cajoling of the population into the acceptance of very authoritarian moves. I, and the case in South Africa of South Africa is amazing, really, if you allow me just to dilate on that a little bit. Sure. Um, politically, a very polarized country. You've got kind of the grassroots voting for the ruling party. The ruling party is incredibly corrupt. I mean... Nothing in the in the West has a holds a candle to it, um, and the kind of elites are mainly not supportive of the 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 the, the ruling party. And what the pro propaganda did was completely invert that. Um, all of a sudden, your well-to-do housewives in leafy suburbia were fully behind a government that they would only have had criticism for just two months before. And almost immediately after the first lockdown, the opposite move was seen in the in the townships. You saw that people were abandoning the mask mandates and any pretense at social distancing. They were getting on with life, hustling along, even during the peak of the whole first wave. And so they, they called BS on the whole narrative very quickly. And, and the, the tone in the townships has never changed. Um, but it's in the it's among the um, well healed elite that there's a complete buy in to the whole bogus narrative and um, support for the policies you will see at the at the high end shopping centers, 100 percent mass compliance, still a great deal of fear people neurotically wiping down their shopping trolleys and that kind of thing. That's interesting because I, I think that that's rings pretty true uh, in a lot of countries, Cer certainly in the West. That's what you said is generally true in, in the West. Definitely university degree or university educated, middle class, upper middle class. Um, for the most part, the elites, uh, they seem to be in the West completely on board where, where the dissent is coming from you know, working class or coming from the sort yeah. of, you know, rural America, uh, talk about, you know, the United States or um, or rural France and, and some of the smaller, um, they say, agricultural uh, strongholds and the same in Italy as well. And so definitely a working class in Italy. So that that's interesting. So I think what you said could be generalized. Uh, yeah, that the, the, yeah. You know, Pierce Robinson explained that to me uh, very, very clearly, and I was very grateful for the history lesson. But th that tends to be the way in, in which uh, propaganda is advanced, that it deliberately targets the elites, the people who um, hold great stock in reputation, um, and you convert a, min a sufficiently large and noisy minority of the elites the rest will immediately stay silent, not wanting to contradict uh, the, the, the general flow, um, also fearing loss of reputation and, and thereby loss of income. And once you've done that, you create the illusion of um, a unanimous or unanimity. Um, and I, I think that's a pretty accurate description and it's, it's, it's where the attention ought to be at the moment, in, in my opinion, is understanding what that propaganda's nature is, where it comes from, 
and what the political agenda behind it is. And, and in terms of, let's just talk about data analytics, because that's that was a big part of how this whole crisis got rolled out so fast uh, in the in the winter and the spring of 2020. All of a sudden, we we're, we were being inundated with, uh, you know, pandemic data, PCR data, uh, cases, uh, COVID deaths, and all all these various different variations of that. Now, you're so you're working a lot with information with data and and you're working maybe in a different way your group of are, are working in a different way in how data is presented because you're drawing from the same statistics you're from the same data the government has We're, we have this problem now with the uh the yellow card uh vaccine adverse reaction uh, uh system database in the uk the government just will not present anything that's compelling or that might sort of damage the vaccine rollout and some of the data is totally lost or disappeared or not accessible uh, to the public on their system. So it, it, it then becomes about presenting data, how it's framed, the context uh, yes. that it's in, the yes. scale of the data uh, in relation to other other things. Uh, and the research question is, what what is the question that's being posed when you mm -hmm. do present data? What What's the con sort of the conclusion that uh, or the, that you're trying to discover? So you're doing a lot of that work. So how is what you're doing at Panda? How does it differ just fundamentally from the way uh, governments and the mainstream media have been handling the same raw material? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. Our, our emphasis has always been on looking at the data from a what I would describe as the conventional scientific perspective of conjecture and criticism. Um, so, you know, our tagline is open science. Um, we, we completely reject this whole narrative of following the science, the authoritarian approach to science. That That is the antithesis of science. The, the word f science should never be in the same sentences follow. Um, and so we did always from the start uh, really emphasize getting our hands on the, the, the raw data and doing the analysis according to the best possible scientific methods. And that was um, really where we got a lot of our insights. You know, I remember when we woke up to the to the fact that lockdowns were actually not uh, reducing deaths. It, it was a, a classic uh, scientific moment. It, it was an accident. We had made the observation that there were incredible disparities from country to country in the in the death rates. You know, you had basically Europe and the Americas had uh, a kind of epidemic leading to first wave deaths of around, you know, a thousand per million uh, people. Uh, but if you looked at the rest of the world, it was less than a hundred, you know. So what accounted for this uh, tenfold difference in mortality? And we started investigating that. And as with any sound statistical investigation, you want to control for the variables you know about. And so we took lockdown stringency as one of the control measures. And um, we're very surprised to see that there was absolutely no relationship. Like when I say no relationship, I mean nothing. There was a paint splat, statistical, technical term, a paint splat. Um, and we, we, we had checked and rechecked our work. And sure enough, um, even, even getting other people to repeat it, you know, that's how sort of surprised we were by it. And uh, sure enough, there was just no relationship. Lockdowns were, if anything, pro-contagion, pro-death. And um, that was that kind of is, for me, the epitome of how science proceeds. You know, we, we didn't go into that exercise with an agenda of showing that lockdowns didn't work. In our previous, in our previous paper, we had blithely assumed that they worked and tried to uh, compare the assumed benefits with um, the method of assessing costs that we had come up with. Uh, so it was a complete surprise, counter-agenda result and um, <clears throat> I guess, you know, you, w what you pointed to there is how important the framing is. If you have people who really do enjoy science and who are on a mission to understand what reality is like, which I think is the job of science, then it's possible to um, uh, take data and really interrogate it, look at, look at it from multiple aspects. When you come in laden with an agenda, it's the easiest thing in the world to lie with statistics and governments all over the world have been doing precisely that. The pharmaceutical firms have been doing that. 
mean, if you want to look uh, at an exercise in data manipulation, it's all the communication around the uh, vaccine manufacturer trials, verging on fraudulent, or actually, no, drop the word verging, just plain old fraudulent, you know. Um, from in, and in not just one aspect, in multiple aspects. So it, it really comes down to an ethical stance that you need to adopt um, in all scientific endeavor. And it's like any uh, area of life, it's corruptible. Uh, money does a lot, incentives, uh, reputational concerns, um, you know, political pressure, peer pressure, all of those things are, are relevant and need to be um, accounted for or monitored very carefully if you want to get good science done. And uh, what we've observed is that the, the, our institutions of public health and um, academic institutions have completely lost that gift. Yeah, and and I think uh, I don't know if you if you see this as well, but you know the globalized aspect of this is the thing I think is so unprecedented, and it's interesting. You listen to panel discussions and you know conferences about uh, geopolitics at these various foundations. They're all over uh, YouTube, and and one thing you keep hearing, even if you're going back a few years, and especially now, is that you know we need to come together in a coordinated way. This is what we heard at COP26 at the climate summit the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. is that we are, all nations need to come together in a in with one, uh, with one single uh, joined up effort, and to tackle these challenges that face uh, humanity. And so the more I hear that line, and I hear it so often now, uh, the the more horrified I get, Nick. Because there's nothing worse than joined up thinking uh, sometimes and, and sort of centralized policy because what happens if it's wrong? What happens if the assumptions are wrong? What happens when the policy is political or that uh, a, a really radical minority uh, in, within these confabs are, are dictating uh, the, yeah. these agendas and policies? And, and, and they, they are trying to hide behind science constantly, but... It, more and more, it's it's beginning to. You can see the risk of this, the globalized aspect of it. Nick, is is, is this escapable, or are we are we into sort of a new phase uh, of of you know the, the the sort of democratic or globalized government experience? I don't know what to call it, but this is very different than individual countries having autonomy and coming together and negotiating it's we have we leapt past that is there any way to escape this well i think you're correct in identifying centralization as the threat you know people keep on saying to me oh it's all authoritarianism or fascism or something like this and and there definitely are elements of those two in what we're seeing but the the the, the weakness or or the problem with the proposed architecture of our political systems is it's envisage centralization and that centralization comes with all of the problems it's always experienced it's kind of suffers from a you know, this time is different uh, illusion as is so often the case when you have terrible things happening in history this time you will hear the 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 centralists the globalists out there saying you know we have much more information at our fingertips. We are able to use our technology to collect vastly more information than other centralists like Stalin, for example. And therefore, we're going to do a better job of it this time. But it, it's a completely infantile argument. Um, you know, the information problem which causes centralized systems to fail 100% of the time is not to do with the access to data but with knowing what on earth to do with it. You know, billions upon billions of decisions are made every second in the world and um, the, the explanations that are required to navigate those decisions correctly are way beyond our technical abilities, our technological abilities, and will probably forever remain so. So it really is centralization that is the enemy. Um, Human, humankind has spent most of its history um, suffering under fairly centralized systems, but they've been, uh, they've never been 
global. They've never been nearly this big. Some empires obviously got to pretty much global extent, the British Empire, the Roman Empire being notable ones. Um, and, you know, for most people, living under those systems is, is, uh, is, is, uh, is bad. And they will eventually uh, fall apart. They, they become the victims of their own internal contradictions and their failure to generate new knowledge because knowledge generation is impossible under conditions of centralization. Knowledge is everywhere and always an evolutionary phenomenon. And in order to have uh, knowledge evolve, you need to have conjecture happening at a very rapid rate. And that is the opposite of what a centralized system describes. So I think it's, it's, it's extraordinarily bad. We know that centralization is bad and why, and it's uh, fools who will attempt it or villains, fools or villains. But inevitably the, the system will come down and uh, a less restrictive one will eventually replace it. The question is how long will that all take? And is there any chance of derailing the current suicidal trajectory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you know, from a from a sort of conceptual and theoretical uh, point of view, I think you you just dis, you know described that really well. That 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 that's fundamentally the problem. Then the question is, how many people can recognize that? And what you just described may be something that is more uh, amicable to somebody who might be, uh, let's say, more on the, in terms of the political spectrum, more on the libertarian free market side, they might, they might recognize your, your, your argument there as, as really important and cogent. Whereas um, not everybody uh, is, is, has the ability, I think, to, um, because of their political or their ideological preference, uh, they might not yeah. be able to look at it through that lens and that seems to be a massive problem. I, I totally agree with you. And I think the effort that we all need to make is to pull people away from the polls. Uh, so, so for example, I talk to people about the scale dependence of um, organizational models. It, you know, common good or um, greater good or uh, community is, is a very powerful um, metaphor, a very pow powerful organizing principle. And, you know, I, I use the example of my own household, which is very definitely communist. You know, <laughs> I, I, I bring home the bacon, but I don't get to eat very much of it. That gets uh, spent on <laughs> the rest of the, the family and the rugrats in particular who were up a huge amount of it. Um, that's a pretty much flat uh, communist kind of system where, you know, all for one, one for all, mm -hmm. um, prevails and uh, you know as you go up in scale the the, the challenges uh, begin to overwhelm that kind of system and by the time you get up to the world health organization what everybody should be realizing right now is that centralizing at the global level is an absolute irretrievable disaster and you don't need to be you know a libertarian to see that um, in fact, I, I think, you know, I, I would never have described myself as a, a libertarian, far from it. Um, but I, I do, I've always had this sense of scale dependency um, that, that I really loathe the idea of these global think tanks with all the talking heads and the absolute volumes of sheer garbage that come out of a Christine Lagarde's mouth or... Um, you know, the, whatever potentate of the day it is, you know, that whether it's a Justin Trudeau or a Ardern or um, Tedros, they're all just absolute cretins and they, they confirm that with every word they utter. And that, that to me is not kind of language that should be at all threatening to the left. The left, the left has had a comfortable place um, fighting against ossifying hierarchies and Authorita authoritarian oppression. Um, and I think uh, my, my view is actually that part of the whole psyops here, part of the propaganda has been a deliberate attempt to drive people into, into the polls. And that's what we have to upset. So we need to create a new language that unifies the people on the left who have you know, civil liberties 
instincts and the people on the right who have uh, anti-authoritarian, libertarian instincts. Because ni- neither the left nor the right is free of authoritarian bias. You know, if you just think of the conservative religious um, people on, on, on what we would conventionally call, call the right. Um, sorry about the hound in the background. He obviously doesn't like authoritarians either. Um, but if you, if you look at the old, you know, conservative religious kind of approach, they're all for authoritarian rules about how you have to uh, live your life on matters, religious, sexual, commercial, whatever. Um, so, you know, neither, neither poll is free of authoritarianism and, and we need to find the people who are the anti-authoritarians on the old left and the, on, on the old right, delete the concepts of left and right, I believe. I mean, I, I think they're actually false dichotomies in many ways. You know, yes. the, 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 real, the real poles are between um, liberal and authoritarian. And I know that will offend a whole lot of people in the U.S. if I say that, you know, people on the right can be liberal. But I believe that's what they have to consider themselves to be, um, because that's that's the definition of an anti-authoritarian is, is a liberal. And then the other the other correct framing is <clears throat> the opposite of a conservative is a is a revolutionary. And right now we should all be liberal revolutionaries. Uh, you know, fighting against authoritarianism and and fighting to overturn the emergent um, system of centralized authoritarian surveillance state. Yeah, you know, de- definitely left and right is is absolutely redundant now. I like that liberal and authoritarian uh, uh, paradigm, uh, and I call it up and down where it's 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 very much now an up and down paradigm with the the top pressing down harder and harder uh, below, and you can call that a, a centralization or whatever whatever it is on top. Uh, it it's it's got an inordinate amount of power and influence. You talked about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, all of these NGOs like the WHO and the interests uh, that are backing those organizations that. The, these are the people. Greenpeace. They're they're at COP26 at the climate summit. They're running. They're running the climate summit. All of our leaders, yeah. our elected leaders, are pandering to all of these people from third sector uh, old organizations or stakeholders, as they're now called. And the biggest stakeholder organization is called right now. The most influential is the World Economic Forum, uh, led yeah. by Klaus Schwab. And they've been pushing something called Build Back Better. And somehow this has become adopted as universal policy, at least across the G7 countries. And I'm sure you've got a bit of that in South Africa. So what what do you think about this? Because I think this is responsible for a potential economic catastrophe that we're actually seeing happening right already, the, the first signs of it. But I want to get your your take on this, as as you've got a good background in in the area of economics and so forth. Yeah, I mean, t- two things. It, I think it's important to see the interlocking nature of these institutions, like the WEF, the Atlantic Council, and so on. You know, there there are many of them, um, and they they all frame things slightly differently. I suppose that's deliberate, um, but you've got many of these concepts, um, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, build back better, new world order, great reset. It's a it's a word salad of um, when you get down to it, fairly hollow terms. And, and that's the second thing is <clears throat> the intellectual poverty of the whole story. When you look at the intellectuals who are held up at at Davos and at the various other conferences that these uh, centralizers tend to frequent. It's astonishingly shallow. It's all invented yesterday stuff. You know, you've got Noval, Yuval uh, Harari, Yuval Harari, sorry, and Peter Singer. You know, Peter Singer talking up the, the great potential of utilitarianism, you know, which is yes, just such a flaky construct that that is presented you know whichever whatever part of it you look at you look at a document like the global risk assessment which is pumped out by the the wef every year and it is just such a it's just prose you know just endless fields of talking about these 
uh, great global threats. Uh, I, I speak about the pattern. The, the pattern is one of itemizing a long list of um, largely fabricated threats and then admitting only completely centralized solutions as answers to those threats. That's the pattern, and all of those organizations do it. That's their kind of shiny toy. Uh, what the, 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 they, they love nothing better than a good chin wag about, I don't know, disappearing topsoil or, you know, in, any one of probably a hundred perceived or fabricated threats and then posing um, some or other international body to rule as to how the entire world should approach this problem. And you know, just going back to that basic uh, notion of science and epistemology, the theory of knowledge, we, we should see straight away that um, uniform monolithic answers to complicated questions will will never be right, not even by accident, you know. The, 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 the systems that they're talking about and dealing with are way too complex for uh, a, a cluster of people sitting around a table at some summit to, um, to solve for, no matter how many think tanks they've got on the books. Um, so it, it, does, it does seem to me that you're right, the WEF is a major player, but it's far from being the only one and you, you've got to see the full penetration of these ideas into any number of institutions of state and the private sector. I mean, you talk even of the intelligence agencies and the military apparatus of countries in the West, um, the financial services sector, um, even whole fields of business, disciplines of business, such as human resources have really been entirely penetrated by this centralizing mindset. And uh, the, the last thing, well, just, just on the back of that, we just got a couple minutes left, but I, I want to get your final opinion. I mean, you talked about these uh, centralized uh, solutions and one of them from the climate summit that's uh, just wrapping up right now is that uh, the president or the leader of India, uh, Modi, He's asking for $1 trillion in, in money from, from the developed world, from the Western countries, uh, in order to sort of, you know, get rid of his coal plants and make the transition to sustainable energy. So, I mean, from your point of view, <laughs> knowing what you know about governments, what do you think would happen to that $1 trillion if that was actually handed over in that way? What would the result be? Well, 500 billion of it would be stolen, and um, of the remaining 500 billion, uh, 300 billion would go into plants that don't work or aren't fit for purpose. The remaining 200 billion would go into um, a woefully inadequate, barely functional kind of system. I mean, we've we you don't have to be a genius to work that out. Um, that's how that's that's how it always works when you have these kinds of. Uh, large troughs for the pigs to eat at, um, and uh, yeah, I mean it's just it it's it's laughable. It is it is just crack pottery on steroids, and um, it's quite something that anybody's taking these things even vaguely seriously. Quite disturbing. But but with since the era of COVID, it just seems like the spigots are open, Nick. Yeah. Like there's just mo the money that is being thrown around. No matter, and now on climate and COVID, uh, it's just I've never seen sums like this. And we used to we used to have massive deliberations over a couple of billion, and that's no longer an issue. They're just like yeah, yeah whatever, thirty, fifty billion, hundred billion. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. I think this Nick could bring down. Uh, not only the, the economies of so many countries, but th this is really, to me, th would threaten the actual principle of democracy. Well, well, it's it's interesting. You know, when I first heard about modern monetary theory, I, I thought, but that's that's so ridiculous. Uh, uh, the only person who would um, conceive of an idea like that would be somebody who was deliberately trying to destroy something. And I actually played with that idea for a little bit. This is all before COVID. I thought, yeah, is, is there is there a segment of people out there who would actually like to see economic destruction? 
and impoverishment of the world? And the, the answer I came to was yes, there quite there quite clearly is, um, and it's it's become clearer and clearer as the days go by. I mean, lockdown, as you correctly pointed out at the beginning of the show, is 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 you know foreseeably destructive and harmful way beyond the benefits it you know it it claimed to involve. Um, so that that's the obvious one in the last two years. But in general, the the whole slant of these um, climate emergency responses, as it's now called, you know, this, this emergency, the, the global crisis, that the whole slant of those is is also unbelievably destructive. Um, there's a long there's a long list of actions that are being seriously contemplated, which only seem to have in them the capacity to cause great destruction and suffering. And you one begins to wonder whether that isn't actually part of the ideology that is distilled out of this in, in these enormous waves of propaganda that the global population has been subject to. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, I, I don't think it's necessarily an accidental or, or misunderstood aspect of the whole story. Yeah, well, uh, suffice to say the cure is, uh, in this case, has been much worse than yeah. the disease. I think we yeah. can all safely agree on that. But listen, I want to, we're out of time, but I wanted to thank you for joining us, uh, Nick, this week. Fascinating discussion. I hope that uh, that we can uh, pick this uh, conversation up uh, in the future as well. There's so many important segues uh, that we need to break off and, and, and explore as well. But uh, thank you so much, yeah. Nick Hudson. Yeah, sure. I mean, we need to just talk about what to do about it, Patrick. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's 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 coming up as well. Yeah. We need to do that uh, as okay. well. But uh, uh, there's a link. Thank to you Nick's. very much. Yes, thank thank you, Nick. There's a link to your uh, Twitter account on our show page. Uh, you want to follow Nick on Twitter if you're on that platform, uh, and also uh, to check out Panda as well. There's a link to their website on our show page uh, as well. So uh, take care, Nick. Take care. All the best. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Nick Hudson. Look, we're going to take a short break and connect our next guest on the other side, Clive to Carl, in just a couple of minutes. I'm your host, Patrick Henningsen. This is the Sunday Wire. We'll be right back. <laughs> 